for this presentation. First, thanks to Angela, Harry, and Daniel for their efforts on this endeavor, and more critically, for tolerating my abrasively direct style. Next, thanks to the White Mountain Research Center, in particular, Gailey and Kinsey, for hosting this lecture series. I'm excited to be speaking at this venue again. However, I do have to admit that I missed the low key ambiance of the uh, White Mountain Research Center campus and uh, bungalow uh, classroom. Uh, hey, this study, hey. yes. Um, could you put your presentation into a uh, presentation mode for the full screen to show up? You bet. Screen. My wife actually mentioned that to me, but I'm um, so technologically inept, um, she's probably <laughs> going to have to help me with that. Can you try this? Is that better? Did that do it? No, darn it. This one? Okay, There's a lot of screens in front of us, sorry. It's okay. Okay. I'm not really sure how to fix it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Is that better? Same thing. So sorry. That's it. You get it? Woohoo! Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> of course, I can't see anything now. I'll have to look at that. Okay. I have to advance with the clicker then. Okay. All right, well, we'll pick up from there. <laughs> uh, this, this study has benefited from a diverse pool of co-authors, contributors, and editors, in addition to a meaningful peer review. Thanks to Kirk Halford, Ashley Blythe Haverstock, Dr. Sita Reddy, and two anonymous reviewers for their professional input and guidance on the paper. Their comments, edits, and suggestions were wholeheartedly considered, and the paper was much improved by their efforts. Special thanks to Richard, Claire, and Charlotte Haverstock, for their contributions during the advanced ground truthing phase of this study. Several NUMU elders contributed aspects of this paper, thanks to my friends Gerald Howard, Raymond Andrews, and Kathy Bancroft. Sarah Soldat, BLM Cadastral Survey, provided guidance related to the Von Schmidt data and the public land survey system. And finally, the project was supported by directed funding from the Bureau of Land Management. This was largely made possible by the support of former BLM Deputy Preservation Officer Tony Overly, and now Acting DPO James Barnes. A big thumbs up and a heart-shaped leaf for each of you. There we go. Just took a second. <laughs> to provide the context for tonight's presentation, I will begin by briefly reviewing the sources of information relevant to the study of NUMU agriculture. Although this is not an ex exhaustive bibliography, 
Most of what we know about Numu farming originates from these sources. These sources include historical observations from surveyors, the military, and early settlers, oral histories from tribal consultants, and a limited amount of scientific research, including a botanical assessment of the targeted crops and two inconclusive archaeological efforts related to a build out of Highway 395. In addition to these scientific efforts to understand Numu irrigation practices, Cavell 2013 and Morrow 2014 recently made use of the Von Schmidt data sets in their effort to identify appropriated water rights for the Owens Valley Paiute. This was the partial basis for the film Paya, which is an excellent source of inspiration for those interested in Owens Valley water situation. Cavell and Morrow based their conclusions on GIS mapping of the Von Schmidt data. They employed limited ground truthing, limited historical document analysis, and even less peer review. The research is not archeologically sound, although it is now circulating amongst the archeological community with limited scrutiny. As we show, identifying new irrigation is complicated by nearly 200 years of land appropriation and water use conflicts that define the historic and present Owens Valley situation. Multiple lines of evidence should be used to draw conclusions that have the potential to exacerbate these conflicts. And the archeological community has a responsibility to ensure we scrutinize our data before we commit them to the permanent record. Where appropriate tonight, I will identify places that Cavell and Morrow erroneously identified new irrigation, but this is not the sole focus of my discussion, and I encourage those who are interested in this aspect of my talk to contact me directly. The first Euro-American accounts of Numu agriculture originated from A.W. Von Schmidt in 1856. Von Schmidt was hired by the Department of the Interior to survey for the public land survey system and identify arable land. This effort was a continuation of the Jeffersonian vision for an agrarian society, in addition to facilitating the orderly transfer of Western lands. Note, I didn't say legal. Von Schmidt recognized and mapped portions of Numu irrigation systems were, and made note of irrigated fields when they intersected to survey transects, and he recognized them. Since there were no European American settlements in the valley at the time, Von Schmidt correctly deduced that the Numu farmers had constructed and we're using these features. The image here is an example of Von Schmidt's mapping. Solid lines depict water conveyance features and their alignment relative to the section line. And in fact, when I say water conveyance, uh, these may be creeks or ditches. Uh, it takes a little bit more probing before you can answer that question. Although sometimes he did designate them as such and, and wrote out what they were. As you get away from the transect lines, the location of these creeks or water conveyance systems becomes much, much more unknown and it's much more speculative. It also helps to consider that the lack of identified features on a given section line do not mean there wasn't a feature there. Von Schmidt did not walk each section line, so it is reasonable to expect he would have missed a substantial number of potential features. He also tended to conflate ditches and creeks, which makes uh, the archeological investigation of this topic a little more challenging. Julian Stewart was able to document additional details about these food production systems in the 1930s. Although this documentation occurred some 70 years post-contact, Native American consultants had recollections of four Numu agricultural systems, which included canals, lateral ditches, and cleared fields. One of these located in the Patanapatu territory near Bishop, California, included more than eight kilometers of canal, providing water for approximately 3,500 3, acres of irrigated fields, primarily containing the food plants Nahavita, which is blue dick, and Taboos, yellow nut sedge. The other area, irrigated areas were to the south at the Tohua, the Tohua Matu district in Big Pine and the Utu Utu Witu district near Freeman Creek, where Keo Hot Springs is currently located, and to the north at Quinnapatu, Round Valley, along Pine Creek and just north of the current study area. Stewart also provided details from his limited field work he undertook visiting the Patanapatu controlled diversions near the current city of Bishop. Stewart noted in 1930 that the Northern Bishop Creek diversion was still in use by white ranchers, although in a heavily modified form. He failed to relocate the Southern Bishop Creek system, noting the presence of considerable disturbance in the corresponding area. Based on his limited understanding, Stewart concluded that the new move food production systems in the Owens Valley did not constitute agriculture.
Lawton et al. revisited the question of pre-contact agriculture in 1976. Their multidisciplinary approach included a thorough literature review and supported the conclusion that new move practices constituted agriculture. They demonstrated that Stewart was unjustified in his devaluation of new move agricultural practices. In addition, Lawton et al. provided some clarification of the associated botany that Stewart had described, in particular regarding Taboos and Nahavita, pictured here on the left. At a minimum, this list of irrigated species compiled by Stewart hints at a much more elaborate and complex agricultural enterprise that has, than has been historically described. It also highlights how little is known about the crops grown by the Numu, with several plants known only by their traditional name. As a, as a point of cultural reference, Taboos, or yellow nut's edge, is on California's list of pro prohibited noxious weeds. But in many parts of the world, including Egypt and Spain, it has been cultivated as an agricultural commodity for thousands of years. Of course, the Euro, um, European American settlers did not have that historical perspective, which diminished that crop's value and their biased views. Okay, so how did I get involved in this topic? In 2017, following the initial release of the film Paya, I was approached by Daniel Pritchard an ecologist and researcher from the White Mountain Research Station regarding a permit to conduct archeological research on BLM managed public lands. He was part of a team that included the late Harry Williams, Bishop tribal member and one of the consultants for the Paya film and geomorphologist, Angela Jacob. They hoped to archeologically identify and date irrigation features related to Numu agriculture. I was asked to join the study to meet the qualifications necessary to conduct an archeological investigation. I frankly was skeptical of our chances given the significant landscape level manipulations of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and housing development. However, I was more than willing to tag along, assist and learn. This map depicts both our initial study area southeast of Bishop Creek and where we finally landed west there in the Horton Creek drainage. I like to refer to this stage as the learning phase of our study. As such, we headed to Bishop Creek to conduct reconnaissance level archeological field survey, the mapping of identified irrigation features and, and other limited testing to ascertain feature profiles and hopefully to recover organic matter from meaningful strata for radiocarbon assay. Like everybody else, we were motivated in part by the map produced by Numu consultants of Stewart's and the Von Schmidt observations, which Lawton et al. calculate using Von Schmidt provided data to include some 3,500 acres of irrigated land. Our approach to fieldwork was episodic and involved a combination of fieldwork followed by extensive historical and cartographic research, with an additional targeted survey, followed by more specific research. The team at this point was operating both as a cohesive unit and individually, sharing data when many new discoveries were found. These cycles continued until we amassed a comprehensive understanding of the extant irrigation features. This took many months. The initial field work was conducted during spring and fall excursions during 2017 and 2018. Our field observations and collected spatial data provided insight in the, into the superposition of ditch and diversion features that had been utilized between at least 1861 and 1939. Most of the features observed in this initial portion of the study area were heavily modified by later historic and modern use, which corresponded well with Stewart's observations from the 1930s. We also identified this historic image from 1918 that is labeled as the Hillside Ditch, Harvey Adams Illegal Diversion. This ditch system has two intakes, both of which emanate from a 40 acre parcel on Bishop Creek. That was owned at this time by the Hillside Water Company. That property, has a water right attendant to it that was granted by the state. We concluded that this remnant ditch system was historic in age. We, we did, however, find a small remnant section of a ditch that did not correspond or terminate at any known patented lands or property boundaries. It did not align with any section, quarter section, or quarter quarter section, and it was not constructed using equipment. These characteristics are consistent with new irrigation ditches, and this short section of ditch is southeast of Bishop Creek. We archeologically tested this feature and found that it lacked datable deposits. Our survey 
background research and historic mapping based findings in the Bishop Creek drainage did not replicate or support those advanced by Cavell 2013 and Morrow 2014. The map on the left of the Morrow study overlaps our initial study area. Morrow and Cavell state that this irrigation system identified in the blue line is clearly associated with the blue dot labeled as an 1855-1856 Von Schmidt surveyed waterway, their waypoint 10. As our research found and continues to find, their mapping project suffers from an issue of scale. On this one to 40,000 scale map, a dot this size is approximately 140 meters in diameter, approximately a football field and a half, or seven chains in Von Schmidt's measurements. Zooming in closer, we can see that the ditch just barely touches this 140 meter wide dot. This illustrates that the identified ditch missed intersecting the Von Schmidt observed waterway by about 70 meters or half the dot width at this scale. If the basis of the argument by Cavell and Morrow is, is that Von Schmidt's data is verified by their fill data, this does not make that point. But something else is amiss here with the data. When I compare the official original general land office BLM supplied version of the Von Schmidt survey plat here on the right, I could not independently locate a Von Schmidt depiction of a waterway at that section point. Seeking resolution, I returned to the Morrow and Cavell data, but found a blank description for data point number 10, as seen below. Based on this information and our findings in the Bishop Creek drainage, we reassessed our goals and shifted our focus to Round Valley, northwest of Bishop Creek. The shift to Round Valley was driven by several factors. Generally, this region was less impacted by development than the area surrounding Bishop Creek. The BLM had completed block survey in portions of the area in 2012. Von Schmidt's maps and notes identified large areas of irrigated fields and ditches across the Horton Creek drainage as depicted on the Von Schmidt plat for that township. And Stewart's tribal consultant had identified a nearby irrigated area, which he referred to as the Quinnipatu. To reference back to the beginning of this presentation, Von Schmidt in 1856 was mapping features in Round Valley prior to any Euro-American settlement. This is the data from some of our initial efforts to survey Round Valley, and they're depicted here to demonstrate how we intensively examine the area surrounding the Von Schmidt observation point, labeled as ditch. We were hoping to better understand the totality of the evidence for irrigation features. To relocate these features, we identify the cadastral marker for this section line and retrace the Von Schmidt survey route using a tape measure and laser rangefinder to approximate Von Schmidt's chain lengths and transects. Transects, sorry. These methods were used to verify GPS data derived from the Von Schmidt survey plots that have been georeferenced and to identify the ditch location. Using ESRI software, we geo-referenced the Von Schmidt plats for the township surrounding the study area, and we were able to ground truth various labeled features from those maps. We concluded that the area observed by Von Schmidt in 1856 had experienced multiple disturbances. Currently, the section line walked by Von Schmidt is a modern irrigation ditch taking water from Horton Creek and directing it to the north. Episodic flooding from this ditch feature had obscured and altered the Von Schmidt observation area significantly. We did, however, locate physical evidence of Numu agriculture in the surrounding area. Identified features include cleared fields surrounded by piles of cobble, extant ditch sections, simple water control features constructed of stone, and a sizable pre-colonial artifact assemblage comprised of milling implements, obsidian debitage, cupules, and mortars. The identified agricultural features lacked the datable organic deposits, however. During the cycles of survey and background research, we also found this area contained a historical, uh, or contained several historical Paiute allotments, which overlap portion of the pre-colonial deposit. These artifacts evidence a blending of culture, and as we assert, a continuity of Numu agricultural practice post-colonization. One of the most unique features identified in the survey is what appeared to be a hand-constructed irrigation ditch running perpendicular to all of the Von Schmidt irrigation features, or observed, the Von Schmidt observed irrigation features. This feature was incorrectly identified by Morrow 2014 as the ditch observed by Von Schmidt in 1856. 
But his position on the landscape running east-west precludes that from being true, as depicted on this slide. Nevertheless, we found this feature intriguing and surveyed the entire two kilometer span. We found that the feature terminated at the 80 acre homestead of Billy Brown, a Paiute man. While trying to explain its position in the landscape, we visited additional Vonchman observation points and noted environmental anomalies and evidence of water manipulation. There were stands of dead willow on terrace flats that were inset within a channel on the dry alluvial fan. These were well removed from any natural water source. We identified constructed water control features within and adjacent to this channel on parcels of land that had never been patented. Along the remnant ditch features, we identified, we, we observed, excuse me, linear changes in vegetation communities, the size of bitterbrush, the density of grass, and certain other plant types. We also observed linear changes in soil composition associated with the water conveyance features due to both erosion and deposition. And finally, we observed that the von Schmidt identified creeks in section 28 and 33 did not naturally connect to any water source, with their upper channel having been blocked from Horton Creek by an antiquated mass flow event. We identified this modified natural drainage feature as the Quinnipatu Channel. The channel served as the main irrigation canal that supplied secondary ditches located on the western side of Horton Creek. The system conveyed water north to irrigated fields opportunistically arrayed along the slope. Within this system, sections of unaltered natural drainage were connected by sections of constructed ditch. Two of these relic water conveyance systems crossed section lines and were mapped as creeks by Von Schmidt in 1856. Others were not mapped by Von Schmidt and may either be of more recent origin or simply were not observed. A hand-constructed cobble and small boulder diversion was identified near the head of the Kwanapatu channel. This diversion enabled the transfer of water from the present Horton Creek into the previously dry channel via a meter scale water diversion channel that's 180 meters in length. Interestingly enough, this irrigation system and its associated fields are outside of the area depicted as irrigated by Stewart's tribal consultant. This aerial image from 1947 shows the upper channel begin, beginning at the diversion, passing into the previously isolated channel and then running to the north, winding through multiple terrace flats before branching. Note that the green vegetation has persisted until 1947, despite the water being shut off by DWP at least a decade earlier. The diversion occurs in a narrow section of the creek where a nick point or small step in the stream bed is located. Water was diverted below this nick point at a high angle of discordance for a short distance and was then directed slightly northwest across the snows of a large boulder bar towards a northwestward sloping lobe of an alluvial fan before cascading into a fluvially abandoned early mid Holocene dry wash. This dry wash has banks approximately six meters high and a channel width of about 20 meters. This abandoned Holocene wash has been cut off from active discharge by an antiquated boulder bearing debris flow deposit, which completely infilled the channel upslope of the Kuanapatu diversion. Below the diversion, the anthropologically diverted flow generally occupied shallow inset flow channels within the larger dry wash. These channels vary between one to two meters in width and are locally armored with cobbles. Once water from Horton Creek was redirected into the abandoned channel, the water flow rate was subsequently controlled and redirected across the fan using several classes of constructed features. These features made from dry stack cobbles and small boulders include berms, weirs, and dams. Berms consist of single and double course linear rock alignments that line constructed ditches while weirs are small dams used to control upstream water flow. The dam and weir features range from 3 or 0.3 to 1.5 meters in height and typically cross the width of the dry wash perpendicular to the flow direction. These features are large and occur within the main dry wash. Additional but smaller scale cobble and boulder features were employed to direct water into branches of the system or to flood fields identified as surfaces which were cleared as cobbles. 
Parade along the upper channel are dozens of terraced flats com composed of fine grain organic soils upstream from these constructed features. Many of these terraces also rem contain remnant stands of dead willow. Along the main channel, dozens of dead cottonwood trees, many greater than 30 inches in diameter, are located among the desert scrub vegetation, a testament to the long duration that water was present within the system. Fields are located where water could be distributed along a moderately sloped flat and where drainage would be good. In many of these cleared areas, rock piles cluster along the edges of adjacent fields or on short cobble high berms along the field. Although similar types of rock piles and field, field berms are found in post-settlement agricultural fields, these are not located on similar slopes nor in similar settings. The image on the right shows several branches of the Kwanapatu channel below the major fork, approximately 2,200 meters below the initial diversion. At 1,500 meters, 5,000 feet in elevation, the westernmost fork of the Kwanapatu channel is intersected by a historic ditch which parallels and approximate the section line and approximates the section line between sections 32 and 33. The red arrows are pointing at this ditch. This feature appears to signify the partial Euro-American appropriation of the irrigation system circa 1874. This historic era ditch differs in form and position from the connected Numu features. In contrast to the upper channel, this ditch has parallel sides, a uniform width of approximately one meter, and an undeviating position on the section line, ignoring both topography and natural features alike. This historic ditch follows the section line north until it enters the homestead of David Olds, where it deviates and divides. This ditch and associated claim likely explain the need for Billy Brown to construct an additional ditch emanating from Horton Creek, lower on the alluvial fan. As Olds, a white man, likely laid claim to all the water in the system, Brown's ditch constructed as a workaround was the lateral ditch originally identified by Morrow, which, get, uh, which got us interested in this area in the first place, which is full, full circle there. This is a partial copy of the Von Schmidt plat for Township 6, South Range 31 East. In addition to his survey points, Von Schmidt noted numerous creeks and a ditch adjacent to the upper Horton Creek. Of note are Von Schmidt's observations in section 26, the upper right arrow. It appears that while Von Schmidt was documenting multiple creeks along the Horton drainage, the natural creek channel lower in the drainage was completely devoid of water. This is strong evidence to suggest that the scale of diversions by 1856 exceeded the total flow of Horton Creek. It also suggests that by this time, all the water in Horton Creek was claimed for beneficial use by the Numu people living in Round Valley. The documentary evidence in our field mapping exercises strongly support our archeological identification of Numu agriculture. However, our stated goal was to date any identified irrigation features. Because the Kwanapatu channel was previously cut off from Horton Creek by an upslope debris flow in the early Holocene, the presence of fluvially deposited materials in the Kwanapatu channel is attributed to human action. Specifically, the diversion of water from Horton Creek in a into the Kwanapatu channel and the subsequent control of these waters using cobble and boulder constructions. Three terrace features located on the upper main channel receive scrutiny. These features, terrace sites one through three, manifest as anthropogenic, anthropogenic terraces formed from sediments being deposited by impounded water. These terrace features were sampled to determine their depositional characteristics and to potentially establish their age. The adjacent natural dry washes cont contain deposits, the, excuse me, contain deposits, deposits which consist of poorly sorted sand, pebble, and coarse gravel, cobble, and boulders in various ratios of class size. These types of poorly sorted deposits are found throughout the fan environment, and auguring suggests that they are also characteristic of what underlies the sampled fine grain deposits. The samples were obtained by augering the impoundment plats with a five centimeter wide, 15 centimeter deep auger bucket extending from a 1.5 meter long handle. Each sample represented approximately 12 to 15 centimeters of depth. 
The agar hole depth was measured after each sample was extracted. Each sediment sample was bagged into a plastic bag and labeled after extraction from the hole. And the hole was sampled until the base of the fine grain impoundment sediment terminated against the underlying coarse pebbles and cobbles, which prevented additional extraction using an auger. The auger used for sampling has a bit that is much narrower than its bucket and cannot accommodate class sizes larger than about one to 1.5 centimeters. Therefore, sampling with the auger terminated a depth of first occurrence with the coarse plastic material. This precluded the auger from penetrating into older underlying fan deposits. All auger sample depths were less than the height of the risers at the down slope termination of the terraces and therefore did not represent fan or wash deposits older than the impoundment. There was no systematic gradation of sedimentary materials within the auger samples. And when the base level was reached, the transition in class size was abrupt, suggesting that the depositional environment remained consistent for a considerable amount of time. The samples were recovered from deposits representing a low energy aquatic environment assumed to be slack water behind constructed deep weirs. Seven samples from three terraces were submitted to the direct AMS of Bothell, Washington for AMS radiocarbon dating. Six samples consisted of organic laden bulk sediments sampled from controlled levels, while the seventh sample consisted of a small fragment of wood found in the soil matrix. Radiocarbon measurements generated from direct AMS analysis of the six soil samples are presented as uncalibrated radiocarbon dates before present, BP. The results here were then converted to calendrical ages, calibrated BP, using the CalLib version 8.2 radiocarbon calibration program. These age range estimates and their associated confidence levels are reported at the two sigma levels. All results here have been corrected for isotopic fractionation. The seventh sample, a small wood fragment, was determined to be modern and was excluded from further consideration. Field notes from the time of collection note that the wood fragment may have been introduced during the sampling process. Oops. The radiocarbon samples support a pre-Columbian date for the, or for the origin of this irrigation system, calculated between AD 1311 and 1438, for those less familiar with the interpretation of radiocarbon dates. These data also indicate that the system was actively utilized for at least four centuries after 1631 to 512 calibrated BP. The possibility of post-depositional bioturbation supports the likelihood that these dates are minimum ages. Subsequent to the radiocarbon results, and based on the concerns of reviewer number two, I, I revisited the Terrace 2 sampling location with the intent of verifying the depositional environment that we believed was present when the terraces were formed. A one by two meter unit was excavated at Terrace Site 2. This unit was positioned adjacent to the inset channel and within the terrace flat, approximately seven meters upslope from a partially exposed cobble weir and approximately seven meters downslope from the head of the terrace. The test unit revealed a remarkably uniform deposit of laminated fine-grained organics and sand consistent with the auger results. The unit excavation verified our understanding of the terrace geomorphology and the validity of the radiocarbon assay with respect to the depositional environment associated with the cobble weir. During the auger probing, great care was taken to derive samples from fluidly deposited materials. The presence of such deposits required there to have been significant water supplying transporting sediments and a depository environment. Water at that rate was only present within the channel when humans diverted Horton Creek via a 180 meter long ditch. The upper channel is within an erosional setting. And even with a human manipulated water supply, these terraces would not form without additional human control. Additionally, the soil matrix abruptly changed below the effluvial sediments and an impenetrable layer of cobble and gravel was encountered as illustrated here. This stratum prevented the auger from sampling the older fan surfaces further supporting our conclusions about the radiocarbon samples and their validity. This slide was not included, I'm oh, sorry. As mentioned earlier, soils within the Quantapatu channel and the surrounding and adjacent cha 
drainages are dramatically different, as these two images illustrate. The Kuanapatu channel contains fine-grained organic soils that are impounded upstream from constructed stone features. These soils are not found elsewhere within the alluvial fan system. The adjacent channels are devoid of fine-grained organics and consist primarily of coarse-grained decomposed granite, which are typical for an alluvial fan environment. This slide was not included in the original paper, but it offers additional support for our findings and makes an impressive graphic. This is a visual representation of the von Schmidt observations of arable land in 1856, adopted from his notes. The darker green polygon reflects the area depicted as prime arable lands, while the lighter green illustrates the second rate arable lands. These polygons are overlain here in ape images of the current vegetation in Round Valley. Of note is the depicted arable lands exceed the currently irrigated lands by about two times. It is also a working hypothesis that the larger polygon represents the actual extent of Numu agriculture within Round Valley by 1856. This encompasses approximately 9,134 acres. That is greater than two and a half times the acreage demarcated by Von Schmidt for the Patanapatu fields near Bishop. Of particular relevance to today's presentation is the correspondence of the Southern Polygon to the location where the Kuanapatu Channel branches and where we identified Numu Fields. Also, the arable lands depicted just north of Pine Creek, which I will address here shortly. I offer that this confirms our field hypothesis and illustrates the beneficial impacts Numu irrigation had on the land, converting low productivity black brush habitat on a rocky and dry alluvial fan into land that von Schmidt was convinced was worthy of farming. Subsequent background research for the study area identified Numu families with patented lands. These included Antoine Brown, Billy Brown, and Nettie Jones. These deposits testified to the persistence of agricultural practices following the 1863 attempt by the United States government to extirpate the Numu people from the Owens Valley. Cruel and dehumanizing, this forced march was only, a temporary, it was only temporarily effective, and by 1866, most of, most of the Numu had returned. It appears that Numu farmers returned to the same locations where they had previously resided. These prime irrigated lands were then occupied by the newly arrived colonizers, so the Numu moved just to the margins of their former fields. The misappropriation and use of these Numu irrigation features was an open secret, with an editorial of the local Inyo Independent from 1870 mentioning that many of the ditches in use at that time were stolen. On the right, the pre-colonial ditch alignments are depicted in blue. The image in the center is how the system appeared in 1947 based on vegetation. The allotment era ditches appear to have utilized the fork of the lower ditch, which is located parallel to and just west of the von Schmidt identified ditch feature, illustrating both change and a continuity of practice. The archaeological assemblage of the Paiute land allotments today is characterized by the intentional and methodological destruction of materials associated with these homesteads. This include the raising of structures using fire and bulldozers, the cutting of all trees at brush height the breakage of all domestic wear, and the cutting and removal of interior fences and pens. Ironically, these acts of concealment and material destruction by LADWP in the 1920s and 30s effectively preserved the archeological record by rendering these items unusable, therefore helping to ensure that the artifacts remained in situ. Shortly after this phase of the study concluded, I was asked to investigate potential impacts to cultural resources resulting from unauthorized recreational trail development near Pine Creek. My subsequent archeological survey found that these trails had intersected previously unrecorded remnant irrigation ditches of unknown antiquity, similar to those found in the initial study area of Round Valley. These newly discovered water conveyance features were outside of the area depicted as irrigated by Stewart's tribal consultants and Von Schmidt had not noted any fields or irrigation features there. To address the questions of age and function, all potential water diversions and irrigation channels were subjected to pedestrian archeological survey. 
Agricultural features, including fields, gates, water checks, rock piles, and reservoirs were photographed, spatially located, and documented. Great care was taken to note the superposition of intersecting ditch features during the documentation effort. Archaeological features associated with the ditch systems, including milling features, were also documented. As with the earlier study, historical documents, maps, and the GLO BLM public land survey records within the study area were, were searched. The expanded archaeological survey and research found the remnants of seven Paiute allotments adjacent to both the southern and northern branches of Pine Creek. These include allotments patented by the Mallory, Longley, Cornwell, Newland, Wright, Joe and Jack, who are likely pictured diverting water in the picture here on the left, and the Williams families. Each of these allotments had an attendant irrigation system tied to specific diversions along Pine Creek. Like the irrigation systems of their non-native neighbors, these diversions reflect the post-colonial change in land, in land tenure and water rights, traveling directly from the diversion point to the patented lands. Once the water arrived at the patented lands, traditional Numu agricultural practice and unique water control methods intended to enhance sediment deposition and water and uh, improve soil quality and the use of water seeping became evident on the landscape. These techniques are not common to Western farming, although some of these practices appear to be employed pre-colonially. In the patented land situation, some practices were seen to be forced by necessity in an effort to make marginal farmlands more economically tenable. The agricultural potential of most Paiute allotments is poor relative to the allotments selected earlier by Euro European American settlers. Typically, Paiute allotments are steeper in slope, have shallower soils, and are rockier than their neighbors. This harsh reality demonstrates the long-term consequence, consequences of racist institutional barriers. This realization was even noted by LADWP in their official records. These images are from a 1930 Ford report where DWP recognizes the low quality grant land granted to Paiute allotments and notices the challenges these present to agricultural enterprises. Of course, the seven Paiute allotments identified ex exhibit extensive efforts to improve the marginal homesteaded land. Much of this work is evidenced by the clearing of rock from their fields. So many are so great are some of these piles that they're actually visible from Google Earth. On the left is an image from the Ford report of a second residence on the Joe Wright allotment. Sitting on the front porch and barely visible in this low quality image is Fanny Stewart, a Paiute elder reported to be 104 at the time of this image. Just visible to the right of her home is the base of a stone corral and, and what it looks like now. The stone foundation of her home is still present, although the superstructure and contents appear to have been burned by DWP shortly after they acquired the property. The small stone dam on the right is also visible in the Ford image of the Joe Wright estate from 1930. The northern half of the original 80 acre allotment was retained in private ownership and now forms a community of 40 acres. The southern portion remains in LADWP uh, ownership. The combined artifact assemblage of the allotments reveals a blending of technology and cultures and the continuance of traditional lifeways. Western objects ranging from metal cans to fine porcelain vessels are located next to obsidian cores and cobble tools. Among the foundations of Western style stick frame constructed homes, a homestead act requirement, are the remnants of traditional homes, including house floors and rock rings. Adjacent, adjacent to these rock ring features are automobile parts and accessories decorative stoneware bowl fragments, and milling stones. Flake stone and cobble tools are also common and are often found in association with metal tools. Many examples of adaptive reuse of discarded Western trash are also evident. Metal containers, for example, were repurposed into sieves of various configurations. Other identified reuses include candle holders, fashioned from tin cans, art created with tin snips, large tins fitted with handles to serve as buckets, and food bowls were cut out and shaped from used cooking tins. 
I had the honor of visiting this location with a descendant Paiute elder. It was uh, one of those amazing life experiences as I was able to show him his grandfather's birthplace. As a young boy, he had visited the location with his mother, but he had never ventured off the road and into the property. And it was really a highlight of the study for me. Of course, in the course of mapping and investigating the allotment area irrigation systems, it became apparent that an older irrigation system underlay the allotment age features. It appears portions of this older irrigation system were incorporated into newer allotment age water systems where they were conveniently aligned. Currently, no datable deposits have been identified within the older ditches from this system. Age here is hypothesized relative, relative to the allotment era system and the stratigraphic superposition of the newer features. Pre-contact features are incorporated into the branches of the older system, and there is no clear relationship with the system to any known property boundaries. As discussed earlier, pre-colonial irrigation systems have no correspondence to historic property boundaries. Water was instead diverted as soon as physically possible, given the topographic constraints, in order to maximize the potential run of the ditches, thereby increasing the distance of spread water, which of course equated to greater yields. While modern standards would discount the agricultural potential of the alluvial fans and Euro-American settlers certainly did as well, these rocky fields of shallow soil produced seed from targeted species when supplemental water was applied. These shallow well-drained soils of low organic matter produce large quantities of seed grass when they receive timely water. In several cases, allotments were successfully patented adjacent to lands that contained extensive pre-colonial artifact deposits. This co-occurrence is not random and speaks to the persistence of place within Numa culture. These deposits include cupules, petroglyphs, milling stations, rock rings, and obsidian scatters indicative of use in the last 650 years before present. As with the Kwanapatu familiar ties to land, it appears that upon their return to the Quinaba, following the unsuccessful attempt by the United States to, to extirpate them, Numu families once again returned to these locations of their ancestral connections. While the most favorable of these lands were found to be occupied, Numu families were able to occupy and sometimes patent nearby lands. Sadly, as illustrated on the right here, some members of our community think that destroying these resources for their own personal gain is an acceptable pastime. In addition to witnessing this firsthand within these sites, the telltale discard or show me piles of artifacts left to these sites uh, evidences this bad behavior occurring. And it's really, really problematic and sad for me to see. Historical research also supports the contention that these identified branches are much older than the superpositioned allotment aged irrigation features. P.E. Rich was surveying this area, sections 8, 17, and 18, in 1930 on behalf of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. He denoted one of the observed ditch features as an old ditch line. How Rich knew that or was able to make this determination is unknown, but he appears to be correct, as this ditch ties directly into an older irrigation system that was partially designed to irrigate a rock-strewn alluvial fan on land that was never homesteaded. The same feature is labeled old ditch line in section eight mapping. This irrigation system incorporated a large amount of land that was never homesteaded or held in private ownership, but nevertheless contains small fields that are shaped by natural constraints, not property lines. In these irrigation systems, features serve to spread water rather than to deliver it to a data destination. These are defining characteristics of pre-colonial agriculture and I believe we actually have two different eras of agricultural enterprise occurring within these in settlements. Numu agricultural features arrayed adjacent to Horton and Pine Creeks have been identified by field survey and verified with historical research and survey plant georeferencing. These Numu age irrigation systems utilize constructed diversions in, construction, in conjunction with natural drainages to distribute water across a broad area of alluvial fan and the valley floor. Radiocarbon samples from three terraces that were created as a result of the water diversion and subsequent manipulation support a pre-Columbian date for the origin of the Kwanapatu irrigation system. 
These dates, together with the newly reported descriptive data, support the hypothesis that a Numu agricultural economy was independently developed rather than derived from Spanish sources. While our data do not rule out the possibility that pre-colonial influences from other indig indigenous agriculturalists may have occurred, the combination of wild crops selected and the unique approach to irrigation employed attests at a minimum to an innovative adaptation of agriculture by the Numu people. Horton and Pine Creek and their associated alluvial fans were modified by ditch construction, rock clearing, and the use of water control features to form an agricultural system that lacks reported analogs in the Western Great Basin. The water conveyance systems employed selected natural drainages as canals and secondary ditches to spread water across growing surfaces. Fields exhibiting various degrees of modification were arrayed opportunistically along the natural alluvial fan deposits and near the course of the ditch. In the Kuanapatu system, some fields were situated within the natural wash and generally lie upstream from constructed water control features. These areas testify to the anthropogenic creation of agricultural growing areas through the use of natural sedimentation processes and the control of water velocity. Other fields occur on high ground adjacent to ditches on the alluvial fan surface, which has been cleared. By 1865, Numu farmers had diverted 100% of the now named Horton Creek for their beneficial use. Archaeological evidence supports the conclusion that these features were misappropriated at colonization. Post-colonization Numu agriculture continued in the immediate area with the Brown, Jones, Longley, Cornwell, Wright, Mallory, Newland, and Williams families. This summary slide captures some central observations we have made while examining this topic. I would offer that by many standards, Numu agriculture is superior to the Western approaches in terms of efficiency, environmental detriment, and system sustainability. From an archeological perspective, these differences assist in the recognition of Numu versus settler approaches to irrigation. The incorporation of natural drainages, including dry washes into Numu irrigation systems has not been recognized prior to this study. Early historical observations noted the size and extent of the ditches in the Potanapatu district, neglecting to mention any incorporation of natural features into their design. These observations likely reflect the perspective of the observer, marrying the societal values of the era with larger constructed manifestations being evaluated as superior. Using an alternative paradigm, Numu agriculture in the Kwanapatu district utilized natural drainage systems enhanced with discrete manipulations to spread water across the harvestable slope, thereby optimizing returns by minimizing the amount of labor expended. In this system, Cultivated areas were developed adjacent to the ditches as dictated by gravity, terrain, and soil substrate. These topographically constrained plots were enhanced through rock clearing and the addition of fine sediments as water velocity slowed and sediments fell out of suspension. This produced a sustainable system where fine grain organic soils were deposited during irrigation. This outcome stands in stark contrast to the Western and current agricultural situation where soil losses are continual and detrimental to their actual long-term sustainability. This study has identified agricultural systems beyond what was known in the ethnographic record. The Kwanapatu Channel irrigated portions of Round Valley well beyond those mapped by Stewart's native consultant. The pre-colonial Pine Creek diversion is also outside of the area reported as irrigated by Stewart's tribal consultant. However, both do occur within land identified as arable by Von Schmidt in 1856. In the Kwanapatu district, it appears that the agricultural techniques were distinct from those depicted ethnographically for Potanapatu and Tohuamatu. The Kwanapatu and Pine Creek systems lack the massive constructed canals and dams which were emblematic of the Potanapatu system. The Kwanapatu system also lacked the distinctively Western rectangular fields replete with main, secondary, and tertiary ditches depicted for fields near Big Pine. Nevertheless, the water conveyance systems identified adjacent to Horton and Pine Creeks drastically altered the landscape, turning much of this portion of the alluvial fan green. The irrigation features, homesteads, 
and associated artifacts document the resilience of Paiute farmers who managed to persist in their agricultural pursuits by melding traditional irrigation approaches with modern technologies, despite numerous institutional barriers. In this way, adopting to the spatial constraints of 80 acre parcels and the second rate soils of their marginalized allotments. The location of Paiute allotments relative to their prime farmlands and Euro-American settlements evidence the systematic marginalization of Paiute people post-colonization. Interestingly, a shift from wild plant harvesting to cultivation parallels other socio-technological changes occurring in the region during the, the time frame in question, 650 years to present. The most relevant changes include the privatization of some food types that had previously been shared, the broadening of diet breasts to incorporate foods with lower economic rates of return, the intensive use of seasonally limited environments, including the volcanic tableland and the White Mountains, and an investment in methods of extracting greater caloric returns from spatially limited territories. The same setting that promoted mass grass seed collection, green, pone, green cone pinion harvesting strategies, and pottery also fostered increased investment in wild crops, eventually constituting agriculture. So this ends the formal presentation, but I did want to take a moment uh, to recognize the recent and timely loss of our colleagues and friends, Harry Williams and Mark Baskell. The Owens Valley has uh, recently lost two of the greatest advocates for cultural understanding. And I'd like to dedicate this talk in their memory. All right, I am willing to entertain any questions you have. I'm gonna stop sharing if I can figure that out. Oops. Yeah, this is uh, Joe Kurtak. Do you hear me? I do hear you. Yes. Yes, I grew up in Rovana and I live in Anchorage, Alaska now, but I spent a lot of time roaming those hills around Rovana and remember some of those places that you're talking about. And I always wondered about those rocks that were lined up like that and then the dead willow brush and such. And I wanted to refer to one of your figures where you show the existing ditch that comes off Pine Creek and then goes around the end of the glacial moraine there on the north side of Pine Creek and goes, I think, to what you have labeled as the Williams Place, which I believe originally was a native allotment. I think it was called the Berry Ranch, and it's now the, uh, owned by the Voget family. In fact, they bought it from the native people. And if you go back up Pine Creek, past the bridge across the creek, about a, maybe another mile up, there's a ditch in, an old hand dug ditch intake there that goes up along that moraine on the north side of Pine Creek and through a saddle and then just sort of disappears into that large spread area there on the north side of the moraine. Are you familiar at all with that ditch? I am familiar uh, with it and it's not through my own doing. Um, Mr. Ingram, Stephen Ingram actually identified that feature for me. And uh, I, I do look at it. I do agree it does have ditch-like qualities, but if you look at the historic maps, it is very curiously aligned with an original trail or road in the area. And so I'm, I'm gonna say the jury is still out on that, um, but, it, but it is a curious feature for sure. And yeah, it, it, yeah. and it definitely warrants a little more um, investigation. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what, if that was something dug by some of the old homesteaders or something like that, but it sure reminds me of, uh, it could be a trail, but it sure reminds me of some sort of possibly a hand dug ditch. Anyway, I just wanted to make this ask you and make sure that uh, you're familiar with it. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Those, those things uh, degrade, uh, like a road or a trail, especially a wagon road, uh, can degrade so much that it's very difficult to identify. Um, I, I've learned a ton by walking around the landscape. And um, I, I made some pretty significant mistakes. I thought I had found a traditional rock alignment. I actually paid a rock art expert to record it. And then uh, Angela Jaco happened to flip over one of the rocks that I was unwilling to touch and uh, identified some plastic from uh, where it was a helipad. So um, yeah, uh, there's lots of room for uh, additional investigation and learning along the way. Yeah, and I'm sure one other thing, I'm sure you're familiar with that quite large glacial erratic that's on the 
the uh, top of that moraine on the north side of Pine Creek. Maybe, maybe that's a different discussion, but I'm <laughs> very interested to know if there's some sort of a, uh, a native story that goes along with that giant boulder that's up there, kind of like Winnedumma or something like that. Yeah. Well, then not a question for me, though. Yeah, I understand. All right. Thank you. Sarah, looks like you have your hand up. Yeah. Hi. Um, hey. Hello. Uh, you had um, that image of uh, von Schmidt arable land versus currently um, currently arable. Mm -hmm. Was that was that based on his like first rate classification or both first and second rate? It's both first and second rate. That's correct. Yeah, and there um, I could maybe I could go back at some point and I was more technologically um, savvy and I could show you. But yeah, there's a darker green area that really is very closely aligned with uh, what's currently irrigated uh, in Round Valley. And then yeah. a, lighter, a lighter green polygon that extends way further up onto the slope in areas where uh, Western agriculture really wouldn't uh, consider it to be very viable, at least without massive manipulations, bulldozing and that kind of thing. And what type of interpolation did you use to get that polygon? I know- I, I basically um, used his, his fill notes that you provided. Yeah. And then overlaid, uh, I think you had also highlighted some sections of the section line. So it is, it is a little rough. That's why you see it's not very smooth. Uh, but mm -hmm. it, paints, it paints a pretty telling picture. Although I was told it looks like a, a dinosaur. As a side note. It does actually, yeah. There you have it. Apparently okay. wearing a cloak or something. I might ask you more about this some other time. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, let's see, Elizabeth was asking where the paper can be accessed. And I'm aware that it was published, Greg, in the Journal of California and Great Basin Anthropology through the Malik. The Malik Museum, Museum, that's correct. Museum, yeah. yeah. Yep, and it's in the current uh, issue. So it, it's uh, volume 42. Is it point one, one, I believe. Yeah. Well, I have a question, Greg. Um, I'm assuming that you guys didn't really, from what I've heard that you guys didn't get re really auger down to pro pro potentially the oldest sediment. So are, will you, you revisit that in the future with different equipment or? Yeah, I, I think not only did we not get down, we're using an auger, you're a little bit more limited in your mm -hmm. precision. So you, you tend to grab a, a bigger amount of, of sediment, a bigger amount of vegetation. So you, you get a wider date range. And I think we can not only refine the dates, uh, maybe probably tighter, but we can also uh, get earlier dates. Um, after my last presentation, um, it was pointed out that I should have been sampling the highest feature in, in uh, the system, because that would probably be the earliest. And, and I agree with that uh, conclusion altogether. Although with the time we were walking around trying to figure out what these things were and we kind of went with the best looking one. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Now's your chance. It's just like Scott. Oh, we've got, a, hand, we've got a hand. Scott Gruber. Yeah, hi. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I'm in Los Angeles. Um, I hear the big boos, but uh, I wanted to ask if, uh, do you know of any historical fiction or um, something that would give me the sense of what life was like from the, um, when the agriculture was um, um, prevailing in the area? I don't... Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any, uh you know, source that you're going to be able to find and read on that topic. And, you know, just putting it into a larger archaeological perspective, maybe um, the, the Numu or Paiute basically were, were written off as uh, hunter-gatherers and fairly nomadic individuals. And, um, you know, as we get more and more into that, that topic of agriculture, it, 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 the biases in those determinations really become much more evident. So, um, you know, I, I think that played a lot into how we viewed early agriculture in the area, and it's in fact it's a, impacted every study and 
everything written about the Paiute sense. Because if, if we wrote the story as it really happened, that when we showed up, they were you know irrigating 9,000 acres in Round Valley and 3,600 acres at Bishop, um, that's, that's a hard sell that they're nomads and haven't really improved on the land and you know don't warrant water rights or land rights, right? There's some more PhDs to be done on the history of the area. It's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, this is this is a vast topic, and uh, there's some really good work out there. Uh, hopefully, more will be uh, put forth into the public domain. A lot of it's squirreled away in great literature or in archaeological uh, papers like mine. We have a question from John Patzer. If you yeah, uh, part of it would be an answer too. We do have the Bayou tribe here has a museum and it shows a lot of their structures and their implements and yeah right here on West Line Street in Bishop but the thing that I don't remember seeing in a museum of course they have it where they've diverted the streams to harvest the fish and blocked it off at our local museum but I'm just wondering what kind of implements they use to dig these ditches I know like some of the, our early stuff was done with mules and uh, other implements, um, but yeah, this is everything from the Egypt pyramids is, yeah, what tools did they use? That's it. Well, well John, uh, I think there is an answer to that and uh, it's really in the oral, the oral history and it was a, a hardened uh, staff of wood. And, and I believe that's the only implement that's ever actually been mentioned. Um, in, in doing all this survey and walking across all that landscape, uh, we actually did not identify any spot where it had to be dug. So it appears to me as if they were directing the water and then controlling where the water flowed and allowing the water to do the cutting of the pathway, uh, which is pretty efficient. And I think that that wooden staff had a lot to do with, with how that was uh, carried out. Thank you, um, Greg. There's some questions in the chat that I can read to you. Okay, I, I saw, I did see Mary's about- Yeah, there's Mary's, girls. Yeah. Joe's, and Joe, Joe has two. Okay. <laughs> First one, Joe asks, do you have any sense of how many occupants were in this area? That is Round Valley during the time period you presented. I, I don't, and that's a really difficult thing to estimate. There are some ridiculously low numbers that have been bantered around and often get cited that there were only 2,000 people living in the entire Owens Valley. I have a hard time believing that given the level of um, social complexity. And as we learn more and more what was actually transpiring here. Um, but you know, looking at the archaeological deposits and either assigning an ethnicity or figuring out uh, how many people created that is really super challenging. Uh, especially given the amount of looting that's occurred um, in the Owens Valley, uh, which is very painful. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, Mary's question is, Greg, could this have any implications for legal water rights? Yeah, um, that's a great topic. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a, uh, an, a uh, working in a advocacy position. Um, but I am pursuing the, the truth related to, to these things and the manifestations of the landscape. And, and I do believe uh, they, they do have implications, uh, maybe not from a legal perspective, but, but more likely from a moral perspective. And I think I tried to make that, that argument a little bit earlier that uh, if the whole story had been told and people had to make the decision, you know, whether these lands were abandoned and uh, free for the taking or whether they were occupied and being used, um, you know, granted it was a racist in different time back then, but I think that's a harder pill to swallow. And uh, the, the culpability of the federal government here in terms of um, identifying the, the best lands and then facilitating the transfer of those lands. Um, and then when those lands were transferred and there were problems with the native population um, resisting those transfers or not playing along, the military comes in and extirpates those folks. Uh, I think there's a lot of culpability and uh, I, I do believe it should be uh, redressed, although that's not really my position. Okay. 
Let's see, Scott shared the Facebook link to the Owens Valley Pike Shoshone Cultural Center on West Line Street in Bishop. If mm, some of you have not gone there before, it's it's a really neat place. So they have a really nice gift shop too from that, you know, local artists. Um, there's also another question from Joe. Um, do you know if these type of agricultural practices were used elsewhere in the Great Basin where mountain features exist that could provide a steady source of water? Yeah, so in the in the paper, I, I mentioned that it's a, a system that doesn't have analogs in the Western Great Basin. Um, in, in the uh, background research I conducted, I did find an example from Utah and uh, written by a BLM uh, employee, BLM archeologist, uh, while she was getting her master's thesis. Uh, and it has to do with Fremont agriculture. And it's a very similar system where they, they use natural drainages and link them up using constructed ditches. And so they actually dug ditches, but they link natural drainage features uh, and finally connected to a water uh, system that was similar to that. But I know of no others. And uh, you know, it probably is because they're very hard to uh, identify. Let's see, Paul in chat is listing that there was a pa a really old paper, not really old, an older paper that was suggesting similar, a similar type of agriculture in the Eureka Valley. Jason, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with that. That, that was written um, by Patch. And unfortunately that turned out to be an, a natural uh, geological feature rather than you know, irrigated ditches. So uh, I think Bob Bettinger uh, debunked that. Oh, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Big bad Bob reputation. took care of it for us. Oh, I the reputation. <laughs> okay, um, I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Oh, here, here we go. For Mr. Howard, so Gerald was my U.S. history teacher at Bishop Union High School. Um, hi, Mr. Howard. Greg, did you look at the John Davidson report in 1859? Yeah, I, I did, and um, I don't cite it in... Um, in my paper, but yeah, that's one of the historical references that that really um, solidified the von Schmidt observations and supported that position. So that, that's a good good paper. I need some notes here. I did list in the chat the our web address. Um, I can also send everyone an email once I post the talk. You are, since you registered, I do have your contact information on file. Thank you very much. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining this evening. Greg, thank you very much for taking the time to spend the evening with us. It's greatly appreciated. Um, I think this is a great start to some very valuable information. Um, and everyone is giving their accolades in the chat if you cannot see it. And yeah. <laughs> Thank I appreciate you so that. Much. I, I, Virtual hand clap. I hope I didn't glaze anyone's eyes over with my uh, repetitious uh, delivery and jargon laden speech. <laughs> no, it was great. Thank you. And hopefully, next time we can do an in person talk. I would like that better, yes. Yes, as an update on your research. Um, and then you're, everyone is welcome to 